Hey, I'm Ron Drodos from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to our journey through the real book number 202, which is Tad Damron's great tune, Lady Bird. It's one of the first tunes, maybe the first 10, that uh, you should probably learn in the real book. It's very common at jam sessions. It's relatively short. It's basically 16 measures long. And it has clear key structures. It starts in C, goes to the key of E flat, or two five, back to C, and then A flat, and then G, and then C again. It does have a tricky turnaround we'll talk about in a few minutes. But basically, what we're doing here in this whole series, going through the real book one tune at a time for, for uh, eight years, <laughs> Uh, 50 tunes a year. I'm just past the halfway point on uh, tune 202. I numbered them all. There's 400 tunes in the real book. And uh, um, we're, we're learning uh, jazz standards in a way that um, uh, uh, we get past the notes. We learn a little bit about the composer or the culture it was produced, in this case uh, bebop or very early bebop or right before that. And then, then we, we dive into the tune. So we have some sense of where it came from and what we can do with it. And then I'll play a solo piano version uh, so you can watch that and hear that. So basically Ted Dameron uh, is a very interesting figure in jazz. Uh, and uh, researching a little bit about him for this video, I didn't realize he was a little early. He started out earlier than I thought. I associated him with like the late 40s into the 50s. And he wrote a lot of great uh, jazz standards, um, or at least several really great ones, besides Lady Bird, Hot House, which uh, Charlie Parker played a lot, um, If You Could See Me Now, which is a great ballad. Um, there's a few more, but, but those are the big three. Uh, if You Could See Me Now, Lady Bird, and Hot House. And um, Lady Bird was, um, uh, the chords for Lady Bird were used by Miles Davis as the basis for his tune Half Nelson, which is also in the real book, so you can compare that. There's some subtle changes in the chord uh, progression Miles um, uh, uh, put in, and also a more bebop, or at least more linear bebop type melody Miles did. So Tad Dameron is a big inspiration for a lot of us, uh, or can be. He, uh, he was not uh, a virtuoso at the piano. There's some great uh, recordings of him playing with Miles Davis, um, a live concert. So Miles liked him enough, he hired him to play in his band, and there's some live recordings of that, like radio broadcasts originally from the late 40s, maybe early 50s. Not exactly sure with that one. But, um, but he was, if you listen to those, you'll hear he wasn't really a soloist. And it's interesting because we think like, you know, if we're, we, we can't even start to play jazz in public or with our friends unless we can just solo you know, up and down the keyboard. That's not true. I mean, I, 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 was, um, uh, I have a student who lives in a town, about 100,000 people in his town. There's a few places he can play jazz, like restaurants and clubs. And he loves working with singers, but he doesn't really like to improvise solos. So I said, hey, either don't take solos on many tunes, just let the singer sing it a few times, or play the melody or embellish the melody. You know, if you're playing, you know, Autumn Leaves or something, you know, your solo can be... He's do stuff like that in the first chorus of his solo, like on All of You, or, or Lester Young on his version of All of Me with Teddy Wilson, where they do embellish the melody during their solos. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You could, you could have a full uh, musical life, working in a, in a restaurant with a singer or something, and, and you do that. You know, I don't think anybody's going to lean over to their uh, significant other while they're eating and say, you know, I really wish they'd stop playing the melody so much. You know, people love the melody and embellish it, make it your own. You don't have to necessarily uh, play bebop or, or swing type solos if, if that's not your thing, right? There's a lot of room in jazz for that, and Ted Dameron's a great example of that. He would play block chord things, maybe an occasional solo, but, um, but he was an arranger. He thought orchestrally. He thought, okay, here's a saxophone section. playing block chords, and you hear it at the beginning of, of Lady Bird, it's just the first, same note. You know, it's like a, a, a trumpet or a sax section. It's like a big band riff. Brings me to my second point. Uh, it says 1947 here, but according to um, 
Robert Palmer in one of his books, he was a, 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 jazz, a writer on jazz and blues, uh, associated with the New York Times and wrote uh, several books. He said that uh, it was really written in 1939, whatever his sources were, 1939. That's fascinating. The beginnings of the swing of the bebop era are sort of uh, um, mysterious, although there's been some live recordings that came out. From 1942 to 45, which is um, uh, the same time the United States was involved with World War II, a lot of musicians were um, uh, in the um, armed forces at that time too, but at that time uh, the musicians union uh, went on strike and no instrumentalists were allowed to record for three years. And um, uh, that happened to be the beginnings of bebop. So you don't get bebop recordings until 1945 and then a lot starting in 46. Um, so what was Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, Charlie Parker doing? The beginnings of bebop. It, it, there's not many recordings out there. Some have surfaced over the years, but there's really not as many as came later. And it's always been a little mysterious, like, you know, you know, who was playing bebop, who was still playing swing, how did it really develop? And um, uh, it happened at, at Minton's Playhouse, that was uh, Minton's um, Uptown House, Minton's Uptown House was one of the places in um, Harlem, New York City, where bebop developed, and you can hear some recordings from that now, Thelonious Monk. But basically, um, you had figures like Don Baez, uh, even Coleman Hawkins, the saxophonist, um, Tad Dameron, um, uh, Art Tatum, they were, they were transitional figures. And my piano teacher, Billy Taylor, wrote a book called Jazz Piano, and what he said was that um, that period, from like, I don't know, like 1938 to 42, 43, somewhere in there, he called it pre-bop, not bebop, but P-R-E, bop, pre-bop, where he said the, a lot of the musicians were using the, the um, harmonic and uh, melodic language of bebop, but not the rhythms yet. So you might get an Art Tatum doing things like, you know, with, with fancy sharp 11s and chords, uh, fancy harmonies, Duke Ellington, but they weren't using the rhythmic language. Bebop's primarily a rhythmic language, a rhythmic style. It's got that kinetic energy, like like a like a rubber ball bouncing off the walls. Bing, boom, 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 boom. I don't know if you can hear it. Someone down my hallway is going, woo! I hope it's good news. <laughs> Maybe it's their birthday, but in case that's why I'm sort of listening a little bit. It's like, woo, what is that? Um, hey, it's life. Jazz is life, right? We include everything. We include everything with what we're playing. So uh, if this was written in 1939, which I don't have any reason to doubt, really, uh, it's interesting because it, the first two measures are a very swing-era riff. The whole tune could have been like that. You know, it sounds like a, a big band sort of shout chorus. But then he does get more melodic. Now that right there, B uh, flat seven, and it's an E in the melody. That's the sharp nine or uh, sharp four, or um, I guess at that time they would have thought of it as, as a flat five. And that's the bebop signature. Bebop, bebop. That's B flat to uh, uh, E. It's a tritone. Bebop, bebop. That's where the name came from. That kind of angular rhythm and um, and the, sh the flat five there a lot of you know a lot of tunes went you hear that a lot and Ted Damron uses it in 1939 I know there's some examples of it but but in this striking way you know bah, 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 that would have sounded exceedingly strange to most musicians and certainly the musical public in 1939. He might have written it then and been one of the first, if not the first. That's totally possible. He was a genius, great orchestrator, visionary, had an incredible ear. And people like Art Tatum were hinting at this. But um, uh, that specific use of the flat five kind of leads me to speculate that maybe, maybe the original version didn't have that. I don't know. Maybe it was an F. 
kind of would have uh, been much more typical of 1939. I'm not saying we can make a conclusion, but it may have been like that. Uh, another famous example from the 50s was when Dave Brubeck wrote his tune, In Your Own Sweet Way. And, um, and he ended just on the fifth. And when Miles recorded it, he goes to the flat five. Miles changed Dave Brubeck's tune to put the flat five in because it was so bebop. And uh, the story I heard, I met Dave a few times. I don't know if he told me this or if I read it somewhere, but uh, he... Um, uh, he was saying that Miles came up to him, well, he went up to Miles in a club and said, I love your recording of my tune, Miles, but why'd you put the flat five in there? And Miles said, why'd you write it? He didn't write it. <laughs> so, so what are these? They missed each other, who knows? Maybe Miles said that ironically, right? Or maybe he meant you should have written it, I don't know. But in any case, um, uh, that's a little uh, uh, background of the tune. This turnaround, I've seen it, it goes from C to the flat three, E flat, to the flat 6, A flat, to the flat 2, so it's 1, that's the last two measures of the tune, uh, not, not including the coda. Um, I've seen it written with all major 7s, and this has a couple of dominant 7s. I'll probably play this version just because it's in the real book, and it's the one you'd probably be using, but you could try it with all major 7s as well. Um, that's tricky to improvise on that. So what I would do is spend some serious time, 20 minutes at a time for at least a few weeks, maybe playing that every measure. Then the next chord. Then the next chord. You know, one chord a measure, just get used to it. And then keep it as a ballad, half notes, two beats each. Eventually, just get used to it, and then eventually you can play it. But I remember it just felt odd for years that, that it felt odd to me. It's like you play the whole tune, and then two bars of feeling weird. Ooh. So uh, anyway, you can just play a G for the whole thing, too. Just like the opening, you do that over those last two measures. Okay, so let's get into the tune. I'm just going to start right on it and have some fun with these uh, those block chords and then see where it takes me. Uh, it, even though it was written in 39 originally, it's, it's a bebop type tune, so let's see where it goes.
You know, it's interesting. Um, I never played it like that before, where I take the ending, the, 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 the turn around, and kind of repeat it as a coda. So it just makes a loop, 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 loop. And then at the end, I did that, sort of got the sharp four in there. C, C7 with a, C major seven with a raised four. It's a Lydian feel. Sharp four, same as the flat five. It's, um, sort of harks back to that bebop thing, maybe in a little different way. Um, it's a great tune. This should be, uh, like I said, if you're playing with other musicians at least, this should be one of the top uh, tunes in your repertoire. Um, check this out, um, and then also um, spend some time with Half Nelson, which isn't quite as popularly played, but um, uh, it'll give you a sense of uh, some bebop lines. Again, my, uh, I mentioned my, my teacher Billy Taylor before. Billy told me that if you want to learn how to play bebop, check out the melodies because they contain the, um, the improvising language of bebop in the melodies. So, um, uh, not so much this tune, because it's a little more swing era, but um, uh, the, um, uh, 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 the way Miles Davis took this and made it into Half Nelson, definitely more bebop, and you get a sense of those, you know, those kind of lines over this. Uh, have fun, um, good luck with your playing, just enjoy it, right? Every step of the way. That's why I always say enjoy the journey, because it's about playing it right now with whatever we can, and then we sort of, as they say, woodshed, keep practicing, drilling things over and over again uh, for, um, for the future. But for right now, um, enjoy what you can do and make the most out of that. Most of us can sound two to three times better just by using what we already know how to play, in, in, a, in a way that uh, the music flows out and, and, and we can get into that mindset. Um, that's the first step. And then you also obviously learn new things as well. But if you just learn new things, you always kind of sound the same. Like, I can barely play this. I can barely play that. So learn how to play with what you can do to maximum effect as you're learning new things and just enjoy every step. So whether, you, whether it's struggling with something or, or just jamming on one or two chords, it's a great tune. Have fun. See you in the next video.